I want to begin with a question that I've asked multiple times, but I'm going to ask it again tonight. And that is, what story are we living as a part of? What story are we living as a part of? And we live as part of multiple stories, our family stories, our nation's story, and so forth. But particularly tonight, as Christians, and as the church, what story are we living as a part of? And that may seem like a, 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 a big, thank you very much, a, a big kind of abstract sort of question that you would expect a theology professor to ask. And, you know, fair enough, I guess. But it's, it is the stories that we understand, it's the stories that we've embedded ourselves in that determine how we act and the choices we make. And let me give you two examples of that with respect to the church. Okay. When the church in America hears somebody threaten about our tax-exempt status, what do we do? Call the thunderers. Well, you know, let me ask the question this way. What story do we believe we're a part of in that moment? Because the church is not primarily in the story of liberty and justice for all and the founding of this country. We've been blessed by the country that we have been privileged to live in and worship in, but that ain't our founding story, right? Now, I'd love for religious institutions to retain tax-exempt status because it's handy, right? But that wouldn't stop us from doing what, it's meant, what it is we're meant to do and be as a church. And if it did, then there's probably something messed up about what we thought we were here to be and do as the church. Right? Now, may it be that that doesn't change. Obviously, we've heard some politicians shooting their mouth off about that in the recent past. Um, but it, it's in a moment like that that we, we kind of find out what story we're living as part of. Let me give you another example. Last three days, I have been uh, working, I work two different positions up at Marquette, and the one works with uh, early career pastors from a variety of different churches, um, acquainting them with uh, um, social issues here in southeastern Wisconsin and, and some major players in this area on those issues. And we've just had a, we call them summits, not retreats, because it's not much of a retreat, it's intense. And we just had our summit, and our summit was on uh, urban issues. So we had some great speakers come in and talk about the history of Milwaukee on issues of race and things like this. It was, it was, it was interesting. But um, as, as part of our discussions, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the pastors shared that recently, um, in the community where he pastors, there's a, there's a homeless man that they that he knows of and, and has had some, some interaction with. And on a Sunday, um, a couple of the ushers said to the pastor, um, uh, Michael, uh, Michael was here today. And the pastor said, well, I didn't, I didn't see him. Yeah, well, we told him to leave. <laughs> so this homeless man comes into the church on Sunday morning when the people are there for worship service, and the ushers invite him to leave. Uh, well, why? Well, they didn't want to disrupt the worship service, probably, right? Or they were afraid that he was going to, uh, you know, try to beg money off of people or something like that. In that moment, what vision of the church's purpose and identity were these ushers living out of, right? And the sad thing is, is that I didn't find that story hard to imagine at all. I could see that happening in a lot of the churches that I've spent time in. I mean, think about how irritated people get if a baby cries in the service, right? I thought we were all about, you know, life and babies and pro-life and all that. Pro-life as long as they're quiet, right? Um, and I think that people probably worried or whatever that, you know, how's this going to reflect? Uh, whatever their, their thinking is. But what, 
what vision of what the church exists to be and do? What what imagination did they have for how the church lives out its identity in that moment when a homeless person comes in and gets asked to leave? Before disrupting anything, rather than understanding who are we as the church and therefore how do we respond. We could multiply examples like that, but these are the, the you know, it's not an abstract question because we choose to live it out. Right? We live out some answer about that uh, all, all the time as, as a church and the decisions we make about what to do with our finances, decisions we make about what it, ministries to invest ourselves in or not. Um, so the, the stories that we understand ourselves to be a part of shape who we are as individuals but also as the church. And we have reached the point in the story of Scripture, this is called Act 5, um, where we start to run out of Bible. All right, we're starting to run out of Bible because we're going to go go to uh, Matthew 28 with me, if you will. It's where we're going to start. Um, we we don't have much left, um, and in fact, we run out of Bible before we get to the end of Act Five. Um, so we have looked at this story, the story of God establishing His kingdom in creation and setting up vice regents in the form of uh, the male and the female in the garden uh, to live in that, uh, live out of that, really, that, that uh, space of uh, union and worship uh, with God and to be fruitful and multiply and to stamp out, uh, stamp out any, uh, any uh, evil that were, were, to, were to come into their presence. And of course they instead as we've talked, they instead embrace, uh, try to embrace autonomy, telling this, making this their kingdom instead of God's kingdom. And they take that authority to themselves, and of course it leads to devastation. The, we've, we've drawn it up there, we've talked about it so many different ways, about the sin and the breakdown, and kind of the catch-all word for that is death. Right? And God intervenes uh, and uh, begins anew, with Israel, and we saw we walked through that over a couple of weeks with Abraham first, and then with Israel as a nation, and the idea that God was was over and over again attempting to taking steps towards renewing humanity, reestablishing uh, his relationship with his people, with humanity, uh, the way it had originally intended, and and not just fixing their sin, but re reenlisting them in the original project. Um, Israel is called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And God doesn't call them, you little rug rats that I've saved out of Egypt, see if you can keep it together, will you? No, He invites them right back into this, this significant role as an intermediary between Himself and the nation. And they turn out to be little rug rats that can't keep the thing together, right? I'm, you know, as, as we so often are ourselves. And then we looked last week at how this story of what God was doing to restore things, restore the, the, God, the divine and human relationship, absolutely, but also uh, the individual and the collective self-understanding, the relationship of us, or Israel, Abraham, to uh, others, especially the nations, and the relationship of humanity to this world. And how the law did that, and all sorts of things. We saw with Jesus how He comes in and He proclaims that God's putting the kingdom back together again. And uh, I've continued to think about what I said last week, that isn't it interesting that, that Jesus never has to explain to the Israelites what He means by the kingdom of God. They get it. God on His throne... We as His people, living as co-regents with Him, sub-image bearers, and living in full harmony. Full harmony with God, harmony with one another, within Israel, and a, a re-established right relationship with the nations. And although they might not have thought about that nearly as much as they should have, that part. But, and and re-established in the land. And when Jesus comes and gives that message, they're all, ah, Right? Except then he interprets it in ways that are like, yeah, yeah, right? Not quite sure. Uh, 
and uh, leads it in a little bit different path and of course ends in his death which in which he overcomes death to set things aright. So what happens at the end of Jesus' ministry is, of course, the what we call the Great Commission. Now here's what I want you to think about as we look at these very, very, very familiar verses. I want you to think about the four relationships. Okay? Um, and if you need to put, like, for now, put the disciples in here, okay? Since that is who he appears to be talking to, okay? Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. This is not in your notes, this is free. Um, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Not just Thomas, apparently. And this is what Jesus says. Came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, let's unpack this briefly from the standpoint of the disciples and the typical four human relationships we've been talking about. First of all, notice that Jesus makes a kingly claim to begin with. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is, this is a sovereign claim, right? All authority has been given to me on, in heaven and on earth. Comprehensive, cosmic authority. God's kingdom has been established. And Jesus is on the throne. So take that sentence in it's completely in the in the story of Scripture sense. Jesus is claiming that the kingdom of God that was established there in Eden, that God that humanity sent into decline and so forth. Jesus is saying, "I have I am the sovereign of this of all things that God has created." Uh, now, even before that, it says, and they saw him and, they, and worshipped him. So, if we want to, uh, so Jesus has just claimed that he's king, all authority, and the disciples worship him, right? So, here we have this rightly ordered relationship between the disciples and, and Jesus. They are worshipping him and recognizing him as, as we'll see in a few minutes in your notes, Lord. Lord. Um, Lord is sovereign language. That's kingly language. When we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying Jesus is King. When we say Jesus is King, we're saying that Jesus has, is reigning over the kingdom that God has, the, 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 effective, the effective sphere of God's influence, His kingdom. Not so much a place, it's a reality. But what else does He say? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What was ingredient in Israel's identity? Light to the nations, kingdom of priests, right? I'll bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you, all this stuff about Israel's relationship to the nations, but we said that from the very beginning, Israel had this orientation to the to the nations, that they existed to be conduits of God's blessing, and God had said to Abraham, "In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed." What does Jesus say to his disciples? Where to go? Everywhere. Go to all the nations. What is what is your relationship, disciples? intended to be to others to or to the nations. You are going to go there and tell them. You're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to put baptism on this side. Because baptism is about our new life, our new identity. We get baptized into the story that is the story of Jesus. Paul says this probably most clearly in Romans 6. Buried with Him in baptism. 
raised to new life. Right? Whose life? My life? No. Jesus' life. There's this totally renewed identity that we have a baptismal identity. And that, that identity that I have is one who has been buried with Christ in baptism and raised to new life. You know the passage as well that Paul says, uh, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Right? But I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. He says before that. Well, what is, what is that about but my identity? And my identity being firmly linked with the tree in the garden? No. With my national status as an Israelite? No. With my identity being thoroughly linked with Christ and the, the story of Christ with His death on the cross. So you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, uh, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Uh, this instruction, and what was Jesus' instruction? This comes in Matthew, which we talked briefly about the Sermon on the Mount, and how in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is casting a vision for what? He's casting a vision for a renewed human community where we don't have to swear oaths because we trust one another, where we don't murder one another, we don't even call each other fool, but we pursue reconciliation, where we don't just love the people that are like us, we love everybody. Right? That restored, renewed humanity with relationships like the Garden of Eden. So he says, teach them to live that way. Teach them the kingdom. Everything that I have commanded you. And uh, again, Jesus has said to go into all the nations and that uh, I am Lord over all the earth. So the, the, the disciples' effective uh, sphere is everywhere, really. He doesn't make specific comments about, about them having the fruit of the vine or whatever. But if Jesus has just said that, uh, you know, I have authority over all heaven and earth, then the sphere of, in which we're living this out is clearly the earth uh, for now that, on which we are. And of course, Jesus says other things. You can't pack everything into the Great Commission. Um, but uh, a couple of other things that I would pull out of this as well. Notice the last thing he says, Behold, I'm with you always. His presence. We talked for the last couple weeks about the key theme that the presence of God, the presence of Christ, is throughout the story of Scripture. He walks with them in the garden in the cool of the day. But then, after sin, there's separation. And God's up there, and the people are in the Tower of Babel are down here. And then, God talks to Abraham, but there's a distance. And then, God moves into the tabernacle, but not everybody can go into the tabernacle. And then, God's in the temple, but then Israel sins, and so God leaves the temple. And then, He sends Jesus, and that's... Well, even before that, they come back to the land, and they rebuild the temple. God says, I'm with you by my Spirit. Um, and then Jesus comes and He is Emmanuel, God with us. We'll see some other things about His presence in a few minutes, but what Jesus says here is, I'm with you. Always. Uh, to the end, end of the age. So it pulls in that theme of the presence of God with His people as well. Uh, I think too here, all right, I hear echoes here of Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is the first commission that is given to humanity, right? To be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What is, what is the commandment, essentially, in Matthew 28? Be fruitful and multiply. Not in a procreative sense, but in a spiritually procreative sense, right? Uh, I don't, God's fine that we keep having children. He likes them, all right? He invented them. Um, so he's fine with that. But the vision that he's casting here is that, okay, there's a bunch of people already out there. Let's be fruitful and multiply them into the kingdom. Let's be baptizing them into a new identity. Let's be bringing them into the new humanity that we have in mind, that God has had in mind. And so there's a, this is, I don't, I would not say that this commission 
replaces that cultural mandate, as it's sometimes called from Genesis 1.28, that, that now people are supposed to stop having babies and we're supposed to just evangelize. Some Christians over the years have kind of interpreted it that way. Um, but but the, it's a, it comes alongside and gives us a new kingdom, a new heaven and earth perspective on the commission to be fruitful and multiply. Right? Which I think is really, uh, this is really free, definitely not in the notes, is really ennobling to know for those who uh, cannot have children or uh, remain single their entire lives. Here we have a second and greater commission to God's people to be fruitful and multiply that doesn't depend on your ability to have babies. Because we can only do that for a period of years anyway. But we can be fruitful in this sense until we die. Right? Uh, being fruitful and multiplying and making disciples uh, with this, this new commission given to people um, in the kingdom. So, uh, so I see, I look at, I look at the, the, the uh, Great Commission here, and I see it being about the story thus far. It's kind of cryptic, but if we're already in the flow of that story, we'll hear echoes of those pieces when, uh, when we look at them. <clears throat> so this is what starts the transition from Act 4, with what Christ has accomplished, into Act 5. And Act 5 is essentially about the church, and, and part of that is in Scripture, and part of that we're living right now. This is why I say we're running out of Scripture in this act, right? But this is also one of the, one of the, the things that I mentioned, I think, in the very first lesson. I bring it back up now because maybe it, it'll make a little bit more sense. If we're telling this story, okay, the Bible ends kind of here, sort of, if we just read it kind of as a historical book. If we read it as a story, like the church, right? You know, Paul martyred in Acts 28. Her, done. No more stories. All over. And history has continued to go on. Know, where's it going? Who knows? Right? Somewhere over here. Armageddon, I guess. I don't know. Right? But if we think of the Bible as telling this whole total story in this kind of dramatic sense that we've been taking in Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Well, Act 5 starts here in Matthew uh, 28, Jesus' commission, or maybe we will talk in a minute about Acts, not Act, but Acts chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and we know that we're going to talk about Act 6 next week. That's the end of the play. That means that we're in the play. So the Bible ends here, so to speak. But Act 5 is still going on. This is us. Okay? I used the illustration a couple weeks ago, and again, I borrowed this from N.T. Wright. I find it useful. Of suggesting the idea... If we had a Shakespearean play, but we only had, like, we had three acts of it, and then we had, like, a piece of Act 4 and, and, a, and a little bit of Act 5, could we, could we put the play on? Like, could we study it enough, know enough about Shakespeare's ideas, that, that we could piece together the, the gap in the middle? And different theories about how well we might do that. But that's the way we want to imagine what Scripture is telling us here. We've got, we've got the script and how the whole play went up to this point. But the play isn't over yet. We've got some hints about how it's going to turn out at the end, right? We've got kind of the conclusion. So he would say this. We've got Acts 1 through 4 total. We've got half of Act 5. And then a little bit, tiny bit of Act 6. Can we live this section? Can we act this section out? And that's the question that hangs over us as a church. That puts us in the middle of the story that's in Scripture rather than us standing here in 2019 and looking back and going, oh, those Bible things happened so long ago. Right. Yeah, they're still going on. So what? That, that's our vision for today. Okay, uh, To look at how does, particularly, how does Act 5 start? Because that's going to really you know, help us with the rest of Act 5. I don't know how long Act 5 is going to be. Been a couple thousand years already. 
but you know, God doesn't seem too concerned about timelines, so it may go a while yet. It could end right now. I just paused, you know, just give God a chance to, you know, come back right now. Uh, it hasn't worked yet, as you can see. Um, I'm pretty sure he's not much paying attention to my timing on those things. Uh, so, that's what we're playing with today. And I see this kind of all encapsulated here in the, in the Great Commission. What else happens in this, uh, in this uh, time period? Well, if we were to go to Acts, you can go to Acts if you want to. Uh, go to Acts. We actually get sort of uh, a replay of um, Matthew 28. And... We have what we call Jesus' ascension. Um, Jesus says in verse, uh, verse 6, they came together. This is Acts 1. Um, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What are they asking? This is Acts, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, yeah. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They're totally down with the story of Scripture, right? They, they get it. Not that they put it in all the terms that I have, right? But are, is now, now? You're going to restore Israel now? You did the whole die and resurrect thing, which we totally didn't see coming, but now, maybe? You're going to restore the kingdom? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority. Jesus' way of saying, I ain't going to tell you how long Act 5 is going to be. Okay? But Act 6 is coming. He says, But for you to live out Act 5, the rest of it, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Israel, in Judea, more Israel, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's the same sort of commission idea going on there. And Jesus is giving his, his disciples a worldwide, comprehensive mission to think about that they're going to do with the power of the Holy Spirit that they're going to get. But then what happens? When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Um, now, you could read that, and you could go, uh, oh, well, it was just a you know a really great Hollywood way for Jesus to go back to heaven. Okay? Um, but... Look just a couple pages later, and it's in your notes there, but how, how does this get interpreted, essentially? What, does, uh, what do the, the uh, disciples say? Look at Acts 5.31 is the one that's in your notes. Um, God of our fathers, this is verse 30, God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. What does Peter imagine is happening uh, at the end of Jesus' ministry and maybe we can say it even at the ascension? He believes he's ascending. And I don't mean spatially, okay, up in the air. I mean ascension in the royal sense. That there would be the prince, right? And when it was his time to be king, he would ascend to the throne. Now it might be literally there were steps to go up, but it was a process of this is the moment where he officially moves from being prince to being regent, king. And this and the, the early parts of Acts have the disciples talking this way about uh, about Jesus. That he has raised God, he has been raised by God to his right hand. This is the place of authority and and honor. He's he is now reigning on the throne uh, of heaven. Not just in Jerusalem, as the Jews had hoped. Again, God's vision was like so much more cosmic than what His people had kind of gotten to. But they would just be happy to have a son of David on the throne of Jerusalem. And God's like, you're just not thinking big enough. Right? How about the universe? I'll give you the universe. King of the universe, can you go with that? Nah, we'll take Jerusalem. Um, it's tempting. There's a little preacher in me that wants to suggest that maybe God's people today tend to have kind of a little lower vision of the possibilities and what His Lordship looks like as well. But I won't preach about that right now. 
I'll leave that to the Holy Spirit. Um, what else? He's given a name. This is Philippians. It's in your notes. There's all of this language throughout these, uh, throughout these, uh, the New Testament of Jesus's exaltation to the status of king, right? Uh, the as the one with authority. Um, God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There's that comprehensiveness again. That every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, that Jesus, the anointed one, is king. Uh, this is again, our, sometimes our language works against us. Christ and Lord have become churchy terms, right? But they're, they're, they're filled with significance. Christ means Messiah, means anointed one. Lord means king, sovereign one. So that every tongue will confess Jesus, a first century carpenter, right, to be the anointed one and king of the universe. That's what's being claimed here, the, the fullness. And that all fits into the story of uh, of. Uh, of scriptures we've been studying. In fact, that's another thing I would say about Acts. If you go and read the sermons at the beginning of Acts, and I encourage you to do this. Right? Again, no criticism intended for a place like uh, like Racine Bible Church, um, but a lot of churches uh, like ours put a heavy emphasis on the cross of Jesus and getting saved from your sins. Right? Uh, I go into heaven when you die. Read Peter's sermons at the beginning of Acts. Peter's not talking about people praying the sinner's prayer and going to heaven when they die. Every time he preaches, he tells the whole story of Israel with Jesus as the culmination of the story and the resurrection as proof that Jesus has completed the, God's plan for Israel. And then basically at the end says, come along and live in the kingdom with us. By what? Repenting of all the time you spent in the other kingdom. Right? And getting baptized into this new kingdom and living as if Jesus is your Lord. Right? That Peter's preaching uh, is, and it's, it's effective preaching, obviously. 3,000 people the first time. Right? No preacher since has had such a great first sermon, right? Great response to his first sermon. I know there was virtually no response to my first sermon. Uh, <laughs> and a fair number of them after that. <clears throat> I, I mean, a few people were like, thank goodness he's done. But that's a different sort of response. The sermons at the beginning of Acts are really telling. The early disciples, when they are enlisting people to be a part of this Jesus movement, they, they embed it in the story of Israel. And what's interesting is that that's not just the case when they're preaching to Jews. Um, when we get into Paul, right? Paul spends all his time with Gentiles. right? And every time you turn around, Paul's talking about Abraham, he's talking about David, to Gentiles. If he was going to pivot to pray the sinner's prayer and go to heaven when you die, you'd think it makes sense to do it when you're talking to, to Greeks. The Gentiles. But instead, he feels like he has to fill them in on the story of Israel. Because it's about the story of Israel, right? This completion of this thing going forward. Paul doesn't cut himself off from the Old Testament. He wouldn't have anything to work with if he had, right? He's constantly recalling the Old Testament story when he explains things. And, I mean, it's a challenge for him to explain things. I'm, I'm not going to pay any attention to my notes tonight. I can see this already. Um, uh, he's he's re constantly and in creative ways explains things. Right? Um, let's go to Ephesians. All right. I actually have this in my notes. They're not in your written notes, but you know, it's in my defense. Uh, Ephesians. Now I'm going to do a really quick flyover, a few things in, in Ephesians. All right. First of all, let's start in Ephesians one and eight, nine, and ten. It says. Uh, I have to start verse 7. 
In Him, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, this, this, these two verses, these couple verses, Paul says what was going on in Christ. He, uh, God has lavished mercy on us in Christ and revealed to us the mystery of His will, which He showed in Christ. What was the mystery of His will? That as a plan for the fullness of time, when all is said and done, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Now, in the face of that, that's not much, it doesn't seem to be much about the whole story thing, right? And in fact, you can, uh, you can move through the first little bit of, uh, of Ephesians and think that, that the whole story of Israel and all that Old Testament stuff is not really, like, doesn't seem to be in Paul's view, right? And yet, by the way, at the end of chapter 1, uh, it, he talks about uh, the, the great working of God's power which He worked in Christ, verse 20, when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named. Um, which is now getting us a little bit into the story because it's clearly about a kingdom. Right? That He has raised Jesus up to this, this, uh, um, this position of authority. Now, chapter 2, we love chapter 2 of Ephesians, right? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works so no one may boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, with God before beforehand, that we should walk in them. Again, no no, no Jewishness here at all, it doesn't seem, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing going on. Look, this is what we love. Pray, preach that, and then call the people to pray the sinner's prayer, right? And then, ah, that's, you know, wonderful. 3,000, I'm sure. Look at the very next verse after all of that. Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. The very next thing that Paul pivots to is the story of Israel. <laughs> circumcision uncircumcision there he says there used to be a time when there was this group called the circumcision and you were cut off from them and separated from what they had in relationship with God he turns right to the story of Israel to explain the situation that the Gentiles are in and what does he go on to say he says you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants and the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that He might create in Himself one new humanity in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both in God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. What was the hostility? Well, the hostility of it was, in part, humanity against humanity, right? Cain and Abel and all that nonsense. But then when God set up this pilot program with the Jews in the Old Testament, there was a different sort of hostility. There's my new humanity that I'm working on with the Jews, and then there's all y'all that are in the old humanity. But what was God's eventual plan all along? Two humanities? The new one and the old one? No. A new humanity. Go all the way back to chapter 1. For the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ. That is, to bring all things appropriately and fully under the Lordship of Christ. And one major component of bringing things all into that oneness and wholeness under Christ was to bring together New Humanity Pilot Program Jews with all the rest of humanity and for there to be just one new man. One new humanity. So Paul immediately pivots to the story of, uh, of Israel. So he says... Uh, access to God the Father. There's the presence. That's in verse uh, verse 18. Right, we're back in chapter 2. 
so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Apostles and the prophets, he brings together the Old and New Testaments there, although it's not a New Testament to speak of. Christ, the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. Temple is Old Testament thematic language. What was the temple? The temple was the dwelling place of God. So now he says, God is uniting all things in, in Christ, and he has brought these two entities together, the pilot program, new humanity, and old nasty humanity, and he has made one new, truly new humanity. And he's made you a temple, which means that he dwells amongst you. This is totally about the story of Scripture that Paul's talking about. He can't do it without the Old Testament. And it's totally in the flow. Uh, now it's interesting that Paul then talks about his own particular mission. He's like, my job is to go around and explain this. Right? That's basically what he says. Verse 7 of chapter 3. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So he says, I have this, this task, this job, to explicate this and to, and to preach, preach this and bring this all together. Now what I like about this next part is that he, he switches from talking about his own mission to then to talk about the mission of the church. Verse 9 again, chapter 3. To bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. What's that mystery? That mystery is the plan, God's plan to unite everything in Christ, including Jew and Gentile, but the whole cosmos, as he already said in chapter 1. But listen to this. So that, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was in accordance. This is according to the eternal purpose that He has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. So He says He now turns and talks about the church's mission, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Who is the church? Well, we know that the church is now this body of believers, new and old, the the, the pilot program Jews with the, the newly included Gentiles. This is all these believers. And what's their job? To make the manifold wisdom of God known. What is the manifold wisdom of God? I think it has two parts. Manifold wisdom of God is the plan itself, which is to unite all things under Jesus Christ. Right? How can I say this another way? Remember that when we got to death in Genesis 3, we basically said that this whole system fell apart. They were not under the lordship of God. And as a result, everything else was a mess. If I could change the word unite here, I would say that the manifold wisdom of God is to restore this. Restore the whole situation. God on his throne, humanity as his his co-regents, his, his image bearers, with all of the other pieces in their rightly related orders. This is, the, this is the manifold plan of God. And a part of that is to get rid of this barrier between Jews and Gentiles, because that was a pilot program. Right? That's part of it. But it's everything else. So the manifold wisdom of God is the plan, but it's also how God was going to get there. And how was God going to get there? He was going to get there through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the manifold wisdom of God, which elsewhere Paul calls foolishness, according to the rulers of the world, right? Because who makes a plan to fix the world by killing a guy? That doesn't fix anything. What does if you raise him from the dead and defeat death, right? But, so that's what he says. Now what I love about this passage is, uh, well, obviously many things, but what is the church's mission? The church's mission here is that through the church, this wisdom of God, this wisdom of God for a renewed order, a renewed humanity, accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, would be made known to whom? It's my favorite part of this passage. When I finally read this and had it sink in, it blew me away. That the, that the church, which I think you can get, 
Okay? Because this is in your notes, which I'm apparently never going to get to. But the church is to be this renewed, established humanity, right? We're supposed to have this, this relationship with the nations that we're calling them to, to, to become part of us, right? We're, trying, we're to bless them, even if they curse us. Uh, we're, we have this baptismal identity. We're children of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, who we are as people is totally defined. God has promised us that we're going to reign with Him over, over a new heaven and new earth. You can totally get down with that. And of course, we worship, worship God in, in, in spirit and in truth. So we're supposed to be the church. Our point, this, this lesson, is that... is that the church is to be this, this new humanity, right? And who are we doing that for? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Not to the nations. Not to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are wrapped into the church, as we can see in front of us today. Our target audience are the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Like the demonic forces and the angels, I guess. Whoever else is out there ordering the universe. That God has essentially said, let me show you what I can do with some human. Right? Let me show you. He looks Satan in the eye. He looks all the forces of darkness in the eye. And he says... Let me show you what I can do with some humans. I'm going to build me a new humanity. That's going to be awesome. And we're supposed to be that. This, this new humanity that does things we're going to talk about and lives this out, this right relationship with God. And we do that empowered by the love of Christ poured out which is the very next thing Paul does is launches into this awesome prayer about us knowing the height and depth and length and breadth of the love of Christ. Uh, but this is, the, this is the church's calling, and Paul has embedded this, I think, entirely within this overarching story of Scripture. And to me, again, uh, e evangelizing and getting people to say yes to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ and praying the sinner's prayer, these are fine things. But... This is a higher, even higher vision. That the, that the humanity that we live out, that the, the, the people that we be, ends up sending a message to the principalities and powers about what God has accomplished in and through Jesus Christ. Who are those principalities and powers? Well, some of them are the demonic forces. In some cases, I think I would say that they are they are the sinful and often human forces of how we do things. How do we accomplish things in our world today? Power. Money. Right? How has God accomplished this project? Humility. Death. Resurrection. And using a mangy lot like us. Right? What does that say to the powers that be, the principalities and powers of this world that would run things on force and oppression? It says, those things aren't powerful at all. This is the power that, that the church operates in. This is, the, this is the way that God has exerted His power. It's profound. And so when we think about, go back to the question at the top of the class, what story do we live as a part of? Why do we take communion? What are we saying to ourselves? Communion reminds us what story we're a part of. What story is it? It's a story about death, humility, self-sacrifice. Right? And the life that God brought from that. And that's to remind us because we're surrounded all the time by other storylines. Political power storylines. Right? Physical power storylines. Financial power storylines. Step on people's heads to get to the top storyline. Right? Liberty and justice for all is that which is going to accomplish it. Or accomplish it by the sword. Or accomplish it by the... And that, but that's not our story. Our story is death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we were baptized into and that we practice 
every first Sunday of the month, <laughs> right? <laughs> when, when we relive, we're reminding ourselves of the, of the narrative that we're a part of, the story that we're a part of, and, and renouncing all those other storylines and ways of doing things. Dude, I got way off from my notes. <laughs> um, it, is that making, making some sense? I need to drink of water. Before I try to go back, you know, segue back into the notes after this exposition of Ephesians. Let me say this about Ephesians further. I never give you a chance to talk. Um, chapter 4 is interesting in that the beginning of chapter 4 of Ephesians is um, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One, 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 one. Go back to chapter one. What's God's plan? To unite, unite, to oneify all things. One Lord, one baptism. This plan of unification, of bringing this new humanity into restoration. And so the next bit of, of Ephesians is Paul going, okay, so how are we doing? Right? And he talks about how this should play out in church. He talks about how it should play out in your home. Husbands, wives, right? He's, what is he telling? He's saying, what is it going to look like if we're going to live before the principalities and powers this manifold wisdom of God to unite, unite humanity and to do so, to restore humanity and to do that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How's that going to play? Think particularly about husbands and wives. Uh, through submission, our least favorite word in the human language, right? Submission. Because why? There's, it's, it's a counter power. Right? It doesn't... It doesn't fly in our world because it's nobody wants to submit. But then he follows that comment up about the wives in submission with saying what to the husbands? Live as Christ loved the church. Gave himself up for her. And as he's saying, husbands, what power paradigm are you going to live under? I'm the man. I'm Christ. I die. Right? I live a completely different power paradigm because... This system doesn't work on autonomy. It works on humility and self-sacrifice, right? And, and so he talks, about, he talks about what does this look like in, in the church. He talks about what does this look like in the home. He talks about what does this look like in your own individual life. And he talks about things like what are you going to put off and put on? What type of language you use? And, and malice and hatred and greed and these sorts of things that are just, they're not... They don't fit this. And then he also talks about what does it look like in, uh, in, in the culture. Slaves, submit to your masters. Live under the lordship, of, uh, live in the freedom that it is to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ, where you can submit to political authorities and not really worry about it because your lordship is elsewhere. Right? And you're going to live this, you're going to live a completely different power paradigm there as well. And then, of course, yeah, you guys know how Ephesians ends, right? Right. This is the armor of God. Why? <laughs> well, this is Paul saying, now, the church exists to proclaim God's plan to powers. Right? You're going to proclaim God's plan, that this is what it is, and it was accomplished through the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The church exists to, play, to proclaim that plan to powers. The powers ain't going to be happy about it. Right? We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The people that were people. The beings that were meant to be this, right? So, this, so suit up. It ain't going to be easy. Right? That's the whole Bible, the whole book of Ephesians. Man, you guys just get all sorts of free stuff. Um, but this is, the, but I, I see that whole thing playing out. In, in understanding what this story is about and where the church's role in it and how Paul embeds his way of thinking and talking about what the church is and who the church is deeply in the story up to this point. We can call it the story of Israel up to this point or we could just say the story that is Scripture up to this point as to what God is doing. 
And, and there's you know, key other key <coughs> movements. We talked about the Spirit already from Acts 2. Um, the, in the Old Testament story, the coming of the Spirit was going to be this clear marker. You'll know when Act 5 begins, when the Spirit comes, so to speak. Okay? And we looked at Ezekiel uh, a, a couple weeks ago. Um, Joel is another key place. It will come about after this and I'll pour out my Spirit on all mankind. Okay, so that became this point in the future that, that they're looking for as a marker between sort of acts in God's plan. And so it does happen. It happens at Pentecost. And what accompanies it? All right, let you talk for a minute. What happens at Pentecost? What comes with the coming of the Spirit? Speaking in tongues. Okay. Speaking in tongues. Prophesying. All right. Prophesying. And both of these things, at the very least, fulfill what Joel and likewise was saying. Okay. I think there's other things going on with them. But... Yeah, they're not cold. Rushing wind. Right? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. But where have we had a rushing wind before in our story? We had a rushing wind that blew over the waters at creation. We had another rushing wind spirit that blew over the waters after the decreation of the flood. We had a, a rushing wind that came over the dead bones in Ezekiel 37 and gave life to them. We also had a rushing wind across the Red Sea for the trilogy. Our God's salvation acts come with a wind, right? Uh, and and so the, what's happening here? This is it, it. It catches us up in the story, right? Uh, if a wind happens seven times in a novel you're reading, then maybe wind is a key theme for the author, right? And this is this is what I say when we read when we read in this sort of expansive way, we can connect dots. Uh, this is this is a this is a wind that um, that is that is symbolic of the the of the presence of the spirit. It's the coming of the spirit, but it's that it's that breath of life it fulfills Ezekiel thirty seven, I think, uh, and it and it and it ties into the story of God's life giving acts all the way from the beginning of of the story. Um, God's presence is often accompanied by fire. And there says that they have little tongues of fire on their head. They're, they're little anointings. Each one of them is anointed with fire. Um, and, and of course, what I mean, John the Baptist had said this, I baptize you with water, but one comes after that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost with fire. Right? And here it is. This baptism, this anointing with fire and power and presence. And then the languages. Uh, the languages sig signal several things. It signals, at the very least, that this is now for everybody. Right? But to me, I also see this undoing Babel. Okay? This is anti-Tower of Babel. At the Tower of Babel, humanity was unified, and they were unified against God, essentially. So God says, you know what? Let's mess with the languages. And humanity disperses. And out of that dispersal comes eventually God's focus on Abraham. Like literally in the next chapter. Right? And God speaks Hebrew for the whole rest of the Old Testament. Okay? And now, God's message is coming in every language. All these languages. And yet they hear and they understand and they're being unified as a, as a people. And of course we get to Revelation that says that every nation, tribe, and tongue. So there's this reunification going on. All nations, all bring, being brought together. Which is, so that's the narrative expression of the conceptual discussion that we just had out of Ephesians. In Ephesians, we looked at Paul's theologizing about this, how Jew and Gentile will come together in one man. Well, what's he doing? This is the story version where they can speak the, the gospel in every, every language so that everybody will be unified under the message of the gospel and there will not be the barrier of language anymore. This. God adverts, okay? God adverts his intention and then he mostly, I think, takes away tongues. This class isn't about that, but here's why I would say this. God likes to signal what he wants to do and then let us do it. So I learned Spanish. God didn't give me, like, you know, tongues of fire to speak Spanish. I worked at it. 
But I do that, and I speak the gospel in Spanish. And this is God's way of going, yeah, I could have hit you up with a wand and let you speak all the languages, but instead, <laughs> you worked at it, you owned it, I involved you in this process. Because again, what's God up to? He's up to saying, let me show the principalities and powers what I could do with some humans. And so rather than giving us all the gift of tongues so we can just walk everywhere, he says, no, I'm going to involve you in a different sort of way. In your humanity, let you get involved with that. God, God has an incredibly high view of humans. Right? Uh, and the role that he wants us to play in the plan and in the story. And we keep wanting like, to shortcut it. We do. We just want him to do it himself. Well, God, if you just showed yourself over in the land, people would come to faith in you. Doubtful. Why didn't you just heal everybody? So I thought it'd be far more interesting to see if I could get a bunch of humans to work together to help hurting people. It seems to be what God is up to. It seems to me. Uh, what else do they do? They form a community church, right? We've already talked a little bit about that. This is a community defined by Christ, defined by their devotion to Christ. Um, I already mentioned from, from Acts, uh, the Acts sermon, their repentance and baptism. Repentance, again, I, I think it's, it's helpful to think, I find it helpful to think about repentance in Scripture this way. We think of repentance as, as like asking forgiveness for our sins, and it is that, to be true, uh, to be sure. But, as I said it earlier, I'll say it again, repentance is us acknowledging our allegiance to a previous king. Okay? That's what, in the story of Scripture, and the story of Christ as king, God as king, what repentance means is we go to Lord Jesus and we say, I showed allegiance to Lord death, to Lord Satan, for far too long. And there's still parts of me that have allegiance to that. And I bow the knee and say, I renounce that. I, re I, I repent of having ever been a part of the kingdom of death and the devil. And I submit to you as my Lord. That's what repentance is, is, is about. Not about, can I remember everything that I sinned? And can I say all those things to God? It's not even just sort of a simple, um, kind of a simple uh, courtroom moment where where you know I I say Jesus forgive me and he wipes the you know the dry erase board clean of the list of my sins. Um, I think it's about our allegiance and renouncing our allegiance to the ways and behaviors of our old king, our old lord. Um, and of course they devote themselves to prayer, teaching, fellowship, communion. They're forming a new humanity. Uh, they imitate Christ. They grow together. The church spreads. Um, I'll, I'll leave a bunch of that for you to read, but I will. I want to explain the two pictures that are a little bit further on. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> they're in there, and they're not self-explanatory. So I don't think anyway. So let me explain. Part of Paul's teaching ministry has to do with um, explaining the difference between Jewish expectation of what God was going to do and how things actually turned out. Okay, And so, uh, the Old Testament kind of gives the impression that we're living in this old age of death, okay? and that there's going to be this moment which it calls the day of the Lord in which more or less in a very quick uh, moment of divine action we will move into the power of the new age okay and not new age like crystals and all that nonsense uh, I mean I mean the new era, the new humanity, the new creation. The Israelites were waiting for a, re a restoration, mostly of Israel, let's be honest, but a sense that this restoration would include um, all of humanity in some sense. And they thought that this was going to be like this decisive moment. The day of the Lord will come, enemies will be defeated, 
uh, unrighteous religious leaders will be done away with. The, the humble and the righteous and the, the obedient will be lifted and restored. Uh, a Davidic king will be brought and put on the throne. We'll get our land back. Everything's going to be hunky-dory and that that's going to happen in kind of a, you know, boom. All at one time. Uh, and then what happened? Well, from the Christian perspective, from the Jewish perspective, <coughs> still waiting. Okay? Uh, from the Christian perspective, this moment came in Jesus Christ. Except, it didn't come in this old way, ends decisively, and now we're totally in the new. Rather, as the second picture shows, there is this sense in which at this moment, we have the inbreaking of Jesus, and particularly His resurrection. Okay? The resurrection equals the, this is the new creation. I know, because it happened on Sunday. Right? We talked about that. New creation in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the new, the new age. The age of life. The age of the Spirit. The age of the restoration began when Jesus rose from the dead. The Spirit power of resurrection and restoration that the Israelites were waiting for was set loose in creation when Jesus rose from the dead. And that was set loose on Jesus and causing His resurrection. But it was set loose on the people of God, at least at Pentecost, if not before. Right? Interesting little moment in John where Jesus breathes on the disciples. Right? And He says, receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, it doesn't happen until a few weeks later. It's like, boop, light bulb goes on. Jesus breathed on us. The Holy Spirit came from Him. Um, but he gives the so there we get the Holy Spirit it happens and yet the era of death is still here, right? There's still sin, there's still evil. Our bodies still die, go in the ground. So what's going on? Well, we have the overlap of the eras. It's basically the way Paul uh, Paul explains it for us essentially that there is this this period of uh, some some. Uh, People call this the uh, this is the already not yet problem. Is it the end times? Yes, it is. How do you know? Spirit came. Is it the end times? Well, not quite. Yes, totally. Is the kingdom here? Yes, and no. Okay. And we live in this time between times. We live in this time period in which the power of the new era is here. I do not well I yeah I do not tire of saying that and I try to say it in as many strong ways as I can in our churches when I have the opportunity to do so. The power that will make everything that Israel hoped would happen happen. The power that will make all the things that the book of Revelation looks towards fulfilling, which that's next week obviously. The new heaven and new earth and the and you know crystal sea and all of that stuff, the power that that uh, that will make the sort of world come to be that you hope for in your best moments of reconciled relationships and no illness and no cry, crying and tears and death, the power that will do that has already been set loose. That is awesome. Now, we can do a couple things. We can look at that and we can say, well, how come it's not at that work in my Aunt Tilly who's got cancer? Right? And if somebody right here has an Aunt Tilly who has cancer, I'm really sorry. I obviously have no knowledge of that. We could get crabby about where the, the spirit power appears to be at work and doesn't work, right? Um, well, if the power of the Spirit, how come that, the, that couple over there that said they were Christians, how come they got divorced? Or how come our church isn't growing? If the power of the Spirit is growing. We can get crabby about it. And plenty of Christians do. Right? What's God not doing there if the power of the Spirit is growing? Um, but I seem to remember that someone who spoke about the Spirit said, the Spirit blows where it will. And you hear the sound of it. Right? 
The spirit power, by definition, is a power we don't control. Right? We can't make it happen on Aunt Tilly to heal her cancer. God may choose to do that by that resurrection power, right? Um, and, but if the Lord doesn't tarry, Aunt Tilly's going to die anyway. Right? So we can be crabby about it. Uh, well, we can also be skeptical that it's there. There's a lot of Christians that are like, we're waiting, waiting for God to do that big thing at the end again, like the Jews were. And I think God's going to do something big at the end. But we can wait. Or we can be kind of crabby that the Spirit's, you know, not about Or we can put ourselves in the places where we might see, hear, feel, and be the place where that Spirit power gets set loose. Um, and I think that that's the sort of anticipation that Paul and the other New Testament authors want us to have. That we believe that that spirit is set loose. We don't control it, but we believe it's set loose. And what that means is any relationship can be reconciled. Might not be, but it can. Any addiction can be broken. Because the power that's going to make all addictions be broken at the end, it's already here. We're not waiting for it, in a sense. It's already been set loose in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. Every neighborhood can be one for Christ. Can. Every nation can be evangelized. Might not be in our lifetime, but it can. The power to do it has already been set loose. And that's the power in which you and I walk and live. Even Paul himself, you wonder, you know that section in what is it, Second Corinthians, where Paul's like, I have a thorn in the flesh. Huh. The power set work in, in creation has already been set loose in creation to heal me of this. So I'll pray a few times to see if it happens. And God said, nope. 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 Right? And what does, what's, the, what's the end of that message? My power is perfected in weakness. Maybe, just maybe, I'll show an even more impressive power in you, Paul, with you suffering that affliction. What a nasty message, right? And yet, again, it depends on what you think God's plan is here. If God's plan is to make you happy, then He needs to hit you with the wand when you've got the thorn in the flesh and make it go away. But if His plan is per Ephesians 4, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers. If God's up to the plan of showing, look what I can do with some humans, Satan, and maybe it's like, let's see how much evangelizing I can do with a half-blind, short, bald missionary. That's Paul, not me. <laughs> <laughs> or fill in the blank with you and what your affliction, affliction is that you think the spirit power should be fixing. God's saying, how can I show, how can I manifest to the principalities and powers how I can through the weakness of humans, through powers like the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, bring unity and bring wholeness under my, under my domain. And show those principalities and powers just how much God can do with humans and broken humans. That's, a, that's a, just a different vision than I think the vision that we tend to think about of what, what we're supposed to live into or what our lives are supposed to be supposed to be life. I feel like in our day and age we have sort of two tendencies. We've got this tendency over here that's sort of like hunker down and wait, keep it sort of simple. Okay, I'm going to try to like, I'll be faithful to my wife and I'll, I'll go to church and I'll, you know, I'll give and I'll just, kind of this, this reduced program. Okay? And, there, and there's good things in there. Being faithful to your spouse and giving money to the church, that's, that, those are good things. But we do it in kind of this bat down the hatches, Jesus is going to come back sometime, just hold on! That doesn't seem to me to be the action of a people that believe that the power that's going to restore all things is already here. Right? And then we got the people on the other side, all the Christians that are like, like, you know, because we enjoy so many bountiful things here in, in America, they think that this is sort of like the way it's supposed to be. And, and oh, the, the life is great and grand, and, you know, oh, this is the way Christianity is. And then something bad happens to them, and they pray, and it doesn't go away, and they're like, well, then, the story's over. God, God didn't do it. Didn't fix it. I'm out of here. Right? It's almost worse for those for whom like it keeps working. That's even scarier, right? I gave money to that ministry and my, my paycheck went up. Whoa. 
right? Just like the guy on TV told me it would. <laughs> um, that ain't our story either. Come back again. What story are we a part of? The Jews got into a bit of a hunker down and wait story. And of course, there's a bunch of them that just got tired of hunkering down and weren't interested or whatever, and they just bought into the story of the nations around them. Are we in the story of hunkering down? Are we in the story of buying into the story of something else, whether it's a story of success and, and you know, God's going to bless me with all these, you know, material blessings if I, if I live a certain way? Uh, are we hunkering down and fearing and waiting for, for Christ to come? Or are we living this renewed humanity in the power of the Spirit that is going to make that world a reality someday and is already set loose. We are the new humanity. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are more human than you've ever been before. And you were made human by a further breath from God. You were made human the first time by the breath of God into a pile of dirt in Genesis 2. And then the, the, the life-giving spirit breath of God has been breathed upon you by faith through Jesus Christ. And you live in the story of a God who through the power of death and resurrection and setting loose of that sort of spirit intends to restore and unite all things to Himself in order to show to the principalities and powers that He can do it. <laughs> it was like none of that was in the notes. <laughs> the bottom of the notes and there is a, another guyogram with church in the middle which probably just begins to scratch the surface of the way that the people of God are intended to be the new humanity and our desire is to bring as many people into that new humanity as we possibly can and those that absolutely refuse to were intended to still be priests of our God to them keeping coals of fire on their head that's who we are and we await the fullness of the new creation. Romans 8, creation is groaning because it's been subjected to sin. And Paul says, I don't think that the present groanings of creation in us can compare to what will be when that final spirit power is absolutely set loose. Uh, that was circuitous. But I said at least as many of the most important things as I wanted to say tonight. So questions, comments, reactions? Clarifications? Yes, sir. I have a question. The Great Commission, I understood it took seven years for them to get out of Jerusalem, the church, and it took persecution. Is that right? Persecution played a significant role in the church dispersing. There's no question about that. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we're intended to draw all that many necessarily lessons, you know, from that. Um, not that you were necessarily suggesting that, that there should be lessons drawn from that, but um, the church started in Jerusalem and it had a, a thriving work and ministry going on there. Um, I don't, I don't get any sense that the church was, you know, digging in its heels on moving beyond that, because honestly, Acts isn't the whole story. Okay. Well, it took them a while to get out to the Gentiles. Well, in Acts, okay, and the reason why I say in Acts is this. So. In Acts, we have uh, we have Philip right. going and speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. That's an exception. So you have right, but it's evidence, right? We also how many of the twelve disciples are talked about at length in the eleven? Sorry, are talked about at length in uh, in Acts? How many? Oh, Peter. Acts is focused on Peter and Paul, right? Luke is doing something with that. Okay, Luke's an author. He's the one he's hanging out with, right? Um, there is traditional evidence that suggests that uh, that Thomas headed headed west, no east, sorry, headed east, and 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 went you know towards India, towards that sort of thing, and and that we you know Luke didn't follow him, right? And so we don't have Luke, you know. So I don't know that it's it, it's it's uh, necessarily historically complete to say to focus on how well the church did in in fulfilling the Great Commission in its earliest days based strictly on what we have in the Book of Acts because we have a couple of disciples get killed, obviously, and there's 
you know, evidence of that. Many of them, several of them stay around Jerusalem and so forth. Um, but then, you know, we have, we have this, you know, there's evidence that things are going. And, and, and the apostles are one thing, but, you know, Jerusalem's a trade route. So we have people coming through, getting saved, and going off into other places. And they're not the apostles, so they don't get books written about them. But, um, you know, the, the, some of these things were getting out, I would imagine, actually relatively quickly. I mean, after all, at Pentecost, 3,000 people. 3,000 people, not just that, but all these nations are represented at Pentecost because they're hearing, right? And 3,000 is saved, and then they go back home because they're only in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Right. So they go back home, and, the you know, it's spreading. Maybe it wasn't, you know, James, the son of Alphaeus, that was doing it. But it was people that had heard the message of the gospel, up and, and, and so I think it, it starts to happen almost immediately. We just don't, the Bible wasn't interested right. in giving us a thorough historic breakdown of, you know, with charts, how quickly did the, did the gospel get to, you know, Cambodia or whatever. And in fact, there's some really interesting things. A few years ago, a historian did a, uh, there's a book called um, something. And, uh, and there, there's like, ancient evidence of Christianity even in as far as Japan like like I want to say like 8th century or something and so that like we you know obviously it's a long time after Pentecost but it's a long walk too like you know so that there's there you know in some places Christianity came had an impact and then it it you know ended up getting dying off or, or you know being oppressed and, and whatnot so it, that yeah that story is a fascinating as well other questions comments Questions, confusions. Do you think we're really failing? Well, that's a relative question, or we're really not doing what we should be doing. I know that's kind of a hard term to define. Yeah. Um, you know, I ponder that question a fair bit because it is, I mean, it, it's, it's heavy for somebody to get up in front of a congregation and suggest that they or the church is failing. Um, I, part of me wants to to go back to Second Corinthians and powers made perfect in weakness. God has chosen to do this thing this way, and He knows what that involves. Right? We don't. We're not. You know, if if let's say that we're a little lax. Okay. Let's you know. Let's not really come down hard on ourselves, but let's say that we're a little lax. Right. It's not like we surprised God with that. Oh gosh darn it, I was expecting to get this whole Christianity thing done by now. But those losers at RBC just, <laughs> good heavens, what, right? Um, you know, and I have studied enough church history, I'm not a church historian, but I've studied enough church, not church history to be able to point at like pretty much every era, <laughs> you know, going back and going, okay, here's what they got pretty good. And here's the ways in which they were falling far short of embodying what it is that we're talking about. There is no pristine era in church history when the church was getting it all right. Okay? There just isn't. If we could get it all right, then apparently, you know, the kingdom has come. And we've had groups that did that church that didn't welcome that homeless guy, and they weren't doing it right. They're not. They're they're not getting it right. But you know, I think that there have been probably moments in the life of RBC where that might have happened I, here I've too. I've seen that in our church. We used to have the mission next door downtown. They moved the mission. The church helped move the mission. Yeah. <laughs> and that's so why I come back to the question. We need to renew in our minds on a regular basis. What story am I a part of? What story am I a part of? What story is we, are we as a church a part of? If we're a part of a story that the upshot is that we try to keep things kind of spiritual and yet comfortable, you know, well, then we're going to do things like get a little, you know, hot under the collar if, if, the, if the culture seems to oppress us one way or the other. But if we believe that we're part of the story in which our founder died and rose again, then our tax status really probably shouldn't bother us that much. And I'm not trying to make a big deal about tax steps. Okay? I'm just finding it as a as a as a, a thing that people kind of get rallied about, right? Um, and again, it's been a benefit. It's a thing, whatever. But and I get the reasons for it. But we gotta 
read that sort of event through the lens of the story that we believe that we're a part of. And the story that we're a part of has these tensions to it. The tension is that our story is founded on a death and resurrection. That we remember. We don't celebrate Christ's ascension here. What we do celebrate at least once a month, death, 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 blood, flesh, death, and resurrection, obviously. And that death and resurrection, sometimes that's a daily thing, sometimes that's a ministry level thing, a ministry suffers and dies, and then something comes around. It, sometimes it's a martyrdom thing. Death and resurrection is a deep principle. It's not just one body dying and coming back to life. I think it's it's a it's a, a way of thinking about what the church is and does and how it does what it does. Um, what's the quote? I don't think it's in your notes. Um, something to the effect of the kingdom of God does not function on the principle of cause and effect, but on the principle of death and resurrection. What does that mean? Well, that's a whole other class. Uh, <laughs> We think of cause and effect, right? I plant a tree, the tree grows, I get fruit. Uh, I give money to this, and uh, you know, we, have, we share the gospel, people get saved, right? This is, we, we live in a cause and effect world. Everything. Flip the light switch, the lights better come on. If they do not, I'm going ape, right? Because that's what's supposed to happen. Well, the last time you were in an elevator and it didn't come fast, you're going to push the button, right? That's not how the kingdom works. The kingdom does not work on cause, effect. Works on the principle of death and resurrection. And we're never told how long there is between the death and the resurrection. We're not told what the resurrection is going to look like after the death. Right? If you look across the scope of Christian history, and even in the stories of people around you, you'll see death and resurrection look like a lot of different things. I have told this story multiple times, and I'll keep names out. Some of you may actually know the people involved, but so many people want miracles, right? They want people healed from things and all of that. But when I have seen God do the miracle of using using someone who was betrayed to then be a catalyst for spiritual growth in the life of the person that betrayed them. That's a miracle. That's resurrection power. That's kingdom. And the restored relationships and the beauty from ashes that we like to say that comes from stories like this are the very things that the kingdom of God is intended, the people of God are intended to model for the spirit powers. And God says, Satan, you thought you could destroy this marriage and you could do this and do this. Well, look what I did with that. Look what I did with that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> set loose, set loose that spirit power, that power of resurrection in my, in my life. Set loose that power in this place and in these people's lives, and even more than setting it loose, energize us to work with the grain of that spirit. Not trying to control it, not disbelieving the power that the spirit intends to have in our lives, but working with the power of the spirit to restore relationships and to uh, to be humble and to reach out and to care for those that are suffering and to do that not hanging on to the outcomes but with joy that you have enlisted us to share uh, in the inheritance of the saints and lights. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and good night.